Welcome back from lunch. I hope you all had a good lunch. We're approaching a time as we get to the sleep material, we call it the midday dip in alertness. It's when all your biological biorhythms converge to make you the least alert. So when I see you nodding off, I don't worry because I know it's just biology. It's not me, it's just biology. But I understand you have to fight your biology along with your, your lunch, so I'll do my best. Uh, the sleep stuff we're going to run through really fast, but before we get there, we're going to do a little more reflection on treatment and do a little bit on prevention. Uh, I have some very good questions here from folks online. What I thought I'd do is I'd read one or two and try to answer them, and then maybe if you have a question here in the room, I'll try to uh, uh, occasion that and then try to answer that. One question we have is, how would you manage a very aggressive student while implementing the increase in demand time? How do you get compliance? Understand, these were very aggressive uh, students, uh, but we've dealt with folks that are a lot larger and uh, been around a longer time than these kids, and how we do it is we expect very little of the person at first, and then we very slowly, gradually increase the demands. Okay, so the whole point is this should be errorless. If you read the article that I alerted you to, uh, Dale was the only one that really had problem behavior throughout this whole skill development process, and because he made mans uh, that were unreasonable, we couldn't reinforce. So there was more extinction being experienced by Dale. By contrast with Bob, it's pretty much all zero. Now why is it all zero? Because he's getting his reinforcer and very quickly at first, and then he just needs to do a little bit more behavior to get that reinforcer. So there's no difference with someone who has severe aggression. It's the same process. I would say if you're getting aggression while you're doing the skill development, you're probably moving too fast. Slow down. Expect a little bit less and gradually increase those expectations as you go. Another question was about treatment integrity with parents. I take no treatment integrity data. The graduate students do very little either. We do go out and coach in the home to transfer the treatment, but I want to make something very clear. <clears throat> One of the advantages of this treatment approach is you can mess it up in the sense that there's no parametric or quantitative criteria that we're really married to. What do I mean by that? You can reinforce the FCR 10% of the time, 40% of the time, or 60% of the time, and I don't know which one is better. You can, increase, you can reinforce the tolerance response once out of 10 times, five out of 10 times. I don't know which one's better. I think they're all good. It's a kind of treatment where it's flexible. The big mistakes are not reinforcing some of these behaviors some of the time. And so the question was, well, do you give parents specific advice on how much? The answer is no. I don't give parents a data sheet with saying now reinforce this and now reinforce that. I just say remember, you have to reinforce these three things. FCRs, tolerance responses, and chains of compliance. Those all have to meet up with reinforcement and it should vary. When we deal with staff though, in highly intense situations, we often do make a data sheet. The data sheet has functional communication responses. It'll have three of those. One tolerance, this is like a recipe, ready? Three FCRs, a pinch of a tolerance response, one tolerance response, a short chain, a longer chain, a longer chain, and a longer chain of compliance. That's about 10 entries. In Excel, I randomize them. We make data sheets that just coast down like that so they can at any one time look and this next time they set the EO, this is the behavior they're gonna reinforce. Are you with me? So if you need to prompt staff, you just put it on a data sheet. What needs to be on that data sheet? I, for me, and I don't know the exact number, we put on about three FCRs, one tolerance response, and three chains. Those chains are often very small, a little longer, to something very long. So on 10 trials, if you will, they might have to do nothing but say, excuse me, ma'am, my way, please, and they may have to do 30 minutes of work that they don't prefer. Are you with me? And they never know which one. And we rotate through those things. Okay. This is a funny one. I'm glad I don't know who you are. The kids you addressed seem to have fairly straightforward reinforcers maintaining their behavior. What happens when the reinforcer is difficult to identify, multiple reinforcers maintaining the behavior, or difficult to access or control those reinforcers? And I want to make it very clear. These kids had difficult to identify reinforcers. They had gone through many functional analyses before meeting our group. 
okay? Their behavior was all maintained by multiple reinforcers, and we couldn't control all those reinforcers, right? Compliance with Dale's man's. So these are those kids, and my response is, do what I've described this morning. There, there's nothing else I can offer you with that. Now, sometimes people might say, yeah, but they're specifying that they want to go home. Say they live in a residential facility, and they're saying, I want to go home. Or they're in preschool, and they want their mommy, and their mommy's not coming for pickup till 3 o'clock. I understand. There are certain times when man's will never be reinforced, and that's the why we need to do delay and denial tolerance training. That's why. So we can say, I'm sorry. Not only is that not going to be reinforced later, it's a no. It's not a later, it's a no. When you think about it this way, though, isn't all denial really delay? Will that child see their mother again? Oh my God, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> okay. But there's very few times in life where it's true denial, it's usually delay. Okay. And, and so I hope that makes sense. What if the child is constantly requesting manding during the delay interval? If you do time-based progressive delay, that's what you'll get. If you do contingency-based progressive delay, they will not be manding during the delay interval. They will be doing what you're reinforcing, playing, working, so on and so forth. Okay. Someone mentions, what if the reinforcer sees you the parent? I bet some of you work with kids where there's no way you can separate the mom from the child or the child from the mom. That's okay. Okay? Sometimes we have mom do the sessions, like Gail. Gail was one of those that really liked to be around her mom, but she didn't tantrum when mom left the room. Some kids do. We actually do manding to get mom. And then we expand, just like we did in this study. So I, I just want to make it very clear. If I separate a child from their parent and there's a big meltdown, I don't do that. If they tell me there's going to be a meltdown if you separate us, parents in the room with us while we're doing all this process. So I, I avoid all that stuff as, but, as much as I can. I follow the parents' lead there. Okay, one more of these questions and see if people in the room have questions. This is a great question. I glossed over this. While in the teaching phase, what do you do if the child displays problem behavior? Nine times out of ten, the answer is nothing. No change. Extinction. It is extinction. I want to make it very clear. Extinction is part of this treatment. Because what, what is the treatment but differential reinforcement? And differential reinforcement has two parts. You reinforce these behaviors and you don't reinforce these behaviors. That don't reinforce is extinction. So this does have an extinction component. Sometimes, like you saw with Dale, we have to implement extinction. We don't love to implement extinction, but that's why we want to do the training and not have parents and teachers do the training in case we have to implement extinction. Because that is what a BCBA can do. Okay, but there's an alternative. Sometimes we deal with people we cannot do extinction. They're bigger than us. We cannot control the reinforcer. I'm a little guy, okay, so I can respect that size differential. So we do what we call differential reinforcement without extinction. Tim Vollmer has a wonderful article on this with one of his students recently. Basically, it's like a, a scale. If they engage in the problem behavior, we do provide the reinforcers immediately because I need to turn that behavior off because they're big, but we provide it for a small amount of time, we provide it a low quality amount of reinforcement. We degrade the quality as much as possible. By contrast, when they engage in the target behaviors, the FCRs, the tolerance responses, the chains, we deliver reinforcement for a longer period of time and that reinforcement is more grand. Are you with me? So it's differential reinforcement where the quality and magnitude vary. Is that our go-to? No. That is not the best way to change behavior. It's a little subtle. It's going to take some time. But when we have people we can't really do anything but, that's what we do. Okay. How about a question from the group? Yes, miss? She's still thinking about her question. Yeah. Okay. And she has it. Um, so what you mentioned was in the, if the problem behavior is still occurring or if it's still being reinforced um, in another setting. So say we're doing this oh, okay. with a kid and the yeah. parents were just saying, do what you've been doing. Yes. Um, so they're still reinforcing the problem behavior. How are yes. we supposed to get control in that setting when the problem behavior is still being reinforced at home? Yeah. It's not a problem. It's called stimulus control. Stimulus control happens all the time. Kids behave differently with their parents than they do with their grandparents than they do in school. Mm -hmm. We're going to get stimulus control. Now, you might worry about carryover. Right. I agree with you. The more kids practice problem behavior outside your sessions, the more likely they're going to bring it into sessions. But you can get stimulus control. You can 
take a teaching situation and get wonderful behavior there. That kid crosses the threshold, gets with his parents, you're gonna see the problem behavior, but that doesn't mean you can't get good control in your session room. So I want you to respect the notion of stimulus control. I want you to understand that you can't achieve stimulus control, and it's just a matter of getting the contingencies out to those other environments, but I caution you against doing that too quickly because I believe the repertoire needs to be built almost in full before we extend it to non-expert, more ecologically challenging conditions. Yes, I think that's great advice, uh, if, and especially if they're doing a keep a lid on it approach, you could say maybe just provide a little bit of that reinforcer, then try to get them back into that challenging situation. Uh, I can't uh, admit that I've done that. I think that might be a little smarter than what I've done. Uh, I usually recommend they just provide all the reinforcers for free until we get that repertoire built up. Okay. Okay, let's go back to one of these questions. When teaching contingency-based progressive delay, is independent play or, for example, a work skill already in their repertoire? It's actually a very, very good question. For the kids I was showing you, they did have these skills in their repertoire. Gail could play with toys. She did not do so independently without her mother, but she had some foundational skills with respect to play. Bob had foundational skills with respect to non-math academics. Dale had foundational skills with respect to his homework. So yes, we were strengthening things that were in their repertoire. We have sometimes work with kids as young as one and a half, two years old, and they don't have many play skills at all. They don't have any work skills. They're two years old for crying out loud, okay? Sometimes we start out with a DRO in the contingency-based progressive delay and not a DRA. That's why we call it contingency-based progressive delay. So what I mean by that is sometimes we'll have a little person just hang out without their mommy, for instance, for 30 seconds, and as long as they don't cry during that 30 seconds, they get their reinforcer. That's like a DRO, right? As long as you don't engage in the problem behavior. While we're trying to shape up those developmentally appropriate skills of playing or doing their work, things of that nature, okay? So that's why we call it contingency-based delay. The delay ends, terminates either based on their behavior but if they have no behavior relevant to those delays, we terminate it based on time without the problem behavior. We never terminate it based on time only. There's always a contingency. DRA is better in our world than DRO. Sometimes we do DRO if there's no A in the repertoire. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, okay, wonderful. This question's a funny one. Any re I'm sorry, it's not funny. It's, it's hard, you're in a hard situation, but I'm gonna recommend you get a new job. But any recommendations for treatment implementation if resources are limited, e.g. 30 to one student to adult ratio and teacher can't provide reinforcer immediately? Let me make it clear. Everything I've gone over this morning has nothing to do with the 30 to one classroom ratio. Do not attempt to even take anything I've said and bring it into the 31 ratio. I am gonna tell you what you might do in that 31 ratio next. But what I've talked about here is one-on-one -on -one micro analytic contingency management at the hands of an expert we know as a board certified behavior analyst. That's what we've been talking about. Extending it into the classroom, that 30 to one, Maybe, I think maybe someone needs to go to that IEP meeting and, evaluate, and advocate for a para. <clears throat> maybe, maybe have grandma come visit the room, you know, get some community helpers in that room, but 30 to one with severe problem behavior? I mean, you need to go to advocacy at that point. I can't help you with contingency management there, I'm sorry. Okay, one more question about this stuff. Yes, miss? Um, so how does it work when you work I'm sorry. We, if you could hold that wonderful thought, and do we have a microphone? Here we go. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I work in a group home setting with yes. adults, and um, we're not there all the time. Yes. Because they have a large caseload. So now, how would this be implemented in that setting? Great. Whether it's in a group home, whether you're a consultant to classrooms, to me, the the experts go in at least a couple hours a week and work on the skill development. 
So whether it's a group home, you're not there the whole time. I understand. I used to manage group homes. I did direct care in groups. I, I grew up in group homes, if you will. I understand the group home culture, okay? If you're consulting to it, you can't be there all the time. You might be there but two hours a week. What I would recommend, if that, what I would recommend is you do this, and wherever you are in the process, you leave homework to staff. And I was describing this at lunch. This is sometimes what the classroom consultants do. Wherever you're doing the shaping of the skills, you have staff watch you, the good staff, the best staff, staff that seem very interested, care a lot about that client. I call them the heroes. I want to find the heroes, okay? I want the heroes to watch me. I want to ask the heroes to do the homework. I don't want the heroes doing the same contingencies all day and every day. I want them going to the same table where I work and practicing the skill I left off on. Then when I come back days later, I'm going to now work on extending that skill. I'm going to go from simple to complex. They're going to watch me. Then I'm going to leave them with the homework. Practice the complex. Practice, practice. So you can do this. Thank you. You can do this on a, a, a space where you only go in infrequently, but you need someone to help you practice. This is all about practicing these skills. But I would never ask somebody in the group home to go beyond where you're at go beyond where the consultant's at. Just practice where you're at. And I also don't want them to do it outside of the practice situation. Okay? Okay, I hope that helps. It does. Okay, very good. Let's, let's move on, folks, because I want to get to the prevention and sleep, okay? Or man, I want to leave you with this take-home point, because this is where we started. So let's end this conversation here. Autism is not a life sentence of meltdown, aggression, self-injury. They came along for the ride, unfortunately and accidentally, okay? Freedom from these problem behaviors is possible with, I believe, a BCBA-led objective analysis. Remember, folks, we are behavior analysts, not behavior assessors. Analysts means we manipulate the conditions to determine their impact on behavior, both in assessment and treatment. Finally, I think it has to be a skill-based treatment yielding functional reinforcers, not given away for free, not just simply withheld, and not just any old reinforcer, the reinforcer they've been working for with that severe problem behavior. And then finally, I think we have to be very, really careful how we teach kids to wait, if you will. I think we need to be savvy, and I think these contingency-based delay procedures are critical to the generality of these uh, treatments. Okay, let's talk about prevention. The prevention stuff is gonna be very short. So I apologize for that in advance, but I'm just gonna go through it very quickly. Sometimes I work in schools, when I work in schools, I follow what's called an RTI model, a response to intervention model. We do school-wide and class-wide, then if the problem behavior persists, we have small group supports, and then if the problem behavior persists, they get what we went over this morning, full functional assessment and analysis and treatment. Very few kids should be getting that. Most kids should get the class-wide stuff. That's what I'm going to discuss uh, now and some small group supports. Okay. So here's a take-home point. Why wait? Why wait to develop communication and toleration and compliance skills? Why wait to teach these until someone develops severe problem behavior? Shouldn't we teach this stuff from the get-go for all children at risk for these problems? Now you might be saying, well, we do this, don't we? we they all have communication and learning to wait programs. But what I see in IEPs is they pass them. They've learned how to communicate. They're moving on. I'm still figuring out ways to get attention appropriately. I'm still figuring out ways to get escape appropriately. I'm still figuring out ways to tolerate things. Okay, to me these are what we call life skills. They never leave the purview of the IEP. We just expect more and better behavior out of kids. So for me, if you want to prevent problem behavior, you have to teach all the skills you would normally teach somebody following a functional assessment process you teach before you have to engage the functional assessment process. And we did this at the University of Kansas. We did this starting in preschools with typically developing children because there was this unfortunate correlation out there and it was that the longer kids of typical development spent in non-maternal care, the more likely they were gonna have problem behavior when they went to elementary school. That was really unfortunate for a guy running a child development center because I had very smart parents come to me with the New York Times article waving it at me saying, I think we have to remove my child from care here. And the data seemed very compelling when written up in these articles. Just not to be an alarmist, let me make it clear. It was a very large study, the largest study done in the history of the United States as far as the sample goes in early childhood education. 
92% of kids who spent the longest time in non-maternal care, which is over 50 hours a week, 92% of those kids were fine. 8% engaged in problem behavior that was up to clinically significant levels, and because the sample size was so good, that was sufficient for the correlation to emerge. Are you with me? But nevertheless, we wanted to address this supposed or possible problem head on. Why are kids in center-based care engaging in so much problem behavior, and what can we do about it? I was the, early child, the director of early childhood education at the University of Kansas, so I was responsible for teaching early childhood educators how to go into their preschools that they were going to go into and deal with problem behavior. When I look in the textbooks, when we looked at the textbook at the time, all the procedures were proactive. If kids were having problem behavior during free play, they're fighting over fire trucks, put out four fire trucks. If they're fighting over crayons, put out more crayons. If Mary and Billy are button heads at circle time, which you know is just a semicircle, a little strange, but anyways, if they're button heads at semicircle time, then you move them. You move them to different areas, right? It's always proactive, antecedent only approaches, but what are we doing? We're avoiding the problem behavior and we're avoiding the situations in which we can teach life skills. Kids have problem behavior because they want a lot of attention. Shower them with attention. Get them an aid. Tell them how great they are all day. That's what we did in early childhood care. Just give them a lot of the reinforcers to stave off the problem behavior. I think what happened is when those kids from center-based care then went to elementary school where the expectations were higher, where you couldn't get out of doing the seat work. You couldn't just go over and do free play as long as you want to. There was not four versions of the reinforcing item. You had to wait, you had to share, you had to communicate, but you didn't have the skills because those skill building opportunities were systematically removed from the preschool. That's what we think is going on. So our point is this. Every skill you teach following an effective functional assessment of problem behavior, we think you need to spend really uh, a fair amount of time in preschool and anywhere else teaching these skills. How to get your sensory reinforcers. How to comply with typical instructions. How to recruit others' attention. How to get out of doing things you don't want to do how to gain preferred materials or context, and then finally how to tolerate it when you can't have this stuff. Now does this look familiar? This is everything we taught kids following functional assessment process. But we taught these skills to all kids with typical development because we don't even know what the risk factors anymore are for developing problem behavior, do we? The fact that you can merely spend a lot of time in non-maternal care being one of them, we said we're going to teach this to all kids. And that's what we did. How do we do it? We would systematically set up periods where kids didn't have attention. We would systematically set up difficult situations. We'd wait. This sounds rotten. This is rotten. You've got to be a little rotten, I think, to do this. Kids would take naps, right? They're on the little cots. Very cute. Nap time is very cute if they're all falling asleep. Then when they're sleeping, we would take their little shoes and tie double knots in them. Uh. That's so rotten. <laughs> then they'd wake up and we'd say, put your shoes on. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Why are we doing that? Because we want them to say, excuse me, help me please. Right? But we didn't just tie them in double knots. We exposed them. We played games. I'm going to explain to them in a minute. We would tell them, today we're going to learn to deal with difficult situations. It's going to be a game. When you least expect it, life's going to be very difficult. And what we want you to do is just say, excuse me, help me please. We first want you to try your hardest. Persist, try to solve it. But if you can't, just say, help me, please. Good luck. <laughs> Enjoy your nap. <laughs> <laughs> Don't avoid the challenging situations. We would put them in place, OK? OK. I'm not going to get into the details. I'm sorry, we don't have time. The first attempt was published in 2007, OK? What we saw from that study was pretty good effects. We replicated it a few years later, but it took us a while to publish it. We replicated it in Head Start classrooms that we had no administrative control over. Okay? What we saw in these two studies is that we got a 74% reduction in problem behavior on average between the two studies. We got a fourfold increase in the skills of uh, responding effectively to their name, following simple instructions, multi-step instructions, using your words to get attention, using your words to get help, using your words to get stuff, tolerating delays and denials, and then we have some friendship skills, saying thank you, complimenting others in distress, and empathy skills. If someone's hurt, what do you say? You say, are you okay? Okay. We didn't avoid the evocative situations. 
Every day we worked on a new skill until that was mastered by the class and we put the evocative situations in place until the skills were acquired on a class-wide level and then we move on to the next skill. Okay. I want to show you these data, they're more recent. This is a more recent study and we call it the Preschool Life Skills Program. This study was published by Kevin Lazinski. he's now at the University of Nebraska uh, Med School. In this study, we used a randomized group design as well as single subject designs to determine whether or not experiencing this preschool life skill curriculum, this kind of aggressive teaching of social skills, whether it would prevent the development of problem behavior. We showed it as an intervention in the previous studies. Kevin was trying to show that it prevented behavior. And you can't show prevention in a single subject design. I just want you to think about it. You have to use a group design to show prevention. I'm convinced of that. Let me show you the single subject design within the group design. Kids were put into either a control group or a treatment group randomly. What, the kids in the treatment group received the life skills training but in small groups. These were kids that were in a thousand child preschool and they were reported to be at the greatest risk for problem behavior but they did not have labels, no diagnoses. So if you had a diagnosis of autism, bipolar, you weren't in the study. But if you had no diagnosis, but teachers reported you had problem behavior, you're non-compliant, whatnot, you were welcomed into the study. This is an example of what happened in the small groups. This is an example of a single subject, a single person called Tex, 3.8 years old. What Kevin did was he had uh, arts and crafts, transitions, or outdoor time. Those are the three contexts he taught in. He would systematically set up situations where they needed to get his attention, to get perhaps some materials or to get some help, and then he'd often would deny them or delay that which was requested. This is called a multiple probe design. In baseline, text does not know how to request attention, request materials or assistance, or tolerate delays. Kevin's putting him in the authentic situations, we're not seeing the skills. Then he teaches this skill. <coughs> takes a long time in a small group, but then he probes all skills and he shows that only the skill taught was acquired. Then he taught the second skill. We see acquisition, he probes all skills, only the two taught were acquired. Then he teaches the third skill by the end, when the treatment's not in place anymore, he's just putting in evocative situations. This young man named Tex is requesting attention appropriately, requesting materials, requesting help, tolerating delays and denials of those reinforcers. So that's what it looks like in a single subject design. These kids experience this curriculum for six months in pull-out sessions in their preschool classrooms. Here are the skill data. Sorry it's in an awkward spot, long story, but anyways, here's the skill data. What we have here is the Control groups data on the top, they did not experience the preschool life skills small group curriculum. The kids on bottom in the test group did experience the curriculum. When they came into the program, direct observation measures showed that they rarely engaged in the skills. They were randomly assigned to the groups. Kevin then worked with the test group, just like Tex, teaching them these simple social skills. Again, these are typically developing but at-risk kids. When all was said and done, the kids who were in Kevin's test group they learn the skills. This is not rocket science, it makes sense, he taught them, okay? But we had to do this because when we tried to apply for grants to scale up the evaluation of life skills curriculum, a lot of the psychologists on the grant committee said, don't kid, typical kids just learn these things? Just give them a little bit of time. Just give them some time, they'll learn these things. I want to make it very clear, typically developing, even typically developing kids do not learn these skills. This is not just autism, folks. Little kids do not know how to get attention appropriately most of the time. They don't know how to get out of doing things they don't want to do. They cannot tolerate delays and denials. And it's not just kids of this generation. I'm fairly certain this is generation free. Okay? To me, these skills are what we call socially constructed. They're socially constructed like our alphabet. Kids will not learn these by accident. They need direct teaching to learn these skills. The reason why I'm showing you these data and this study is because of these data. These are the more exciting data to me. Again, the kids were randomly assigned to the treatment and control group. You'll see in baseline, the first panel, the test group actually engaged in more problem behavior than the children in the control group. That's an artifact of randomization. Okay. Now look at the treatment group, the test group, after preschool life skills training. This is in maintenance. The treatment is not in place. Zero problem behavior. We're very proud of those data. But this is even more important. Look at the kids in the control group. They started out not having problem behavior. 
and they experienced the same amount of teaching time as those other kids except the evocative situations were avoided. They were giving everything for free. Attention for free. Stuff for free. In the test group, Kevin would hand out Elmo's glue and the caps would all be dried and crusty and the kids were like, ah, get it my glue. And they'd have to say, excuse me, Kevin, may, will you help me with the glue, please? By contrast, what do we do with the kids in the control group? Undid all the glue for them, right? You, you with me? Okay. Look at the problem behavior of the kids in the control group over time. A huge increase. Our point here is that kids who experience the life skills curriculum, it not only teaches skills, it prevents the development of problem behavior. And these are the data upon which we make that a sort of statement. Preschools are designed around this proactive, antecedent-only approach. This is a dangerous approach for kids at risk for developing problem behavior. We need to expose them, to inoculate them to challenging situations and then teach them skills to effectively manage those situations. Again, I'm showing you this because this is not just autism, folks. This is kids. Kids need to learn these skills. We've since replicated this uh, in kids with, uh, with autism in classrooms. and We hope to publish those data soon. Okay. That's all I have on prevention. It's mighty quick. Every skill we talked about this morning is what we teach young kids with any risk for problem behavior. We teach it at a class-wide level. If kids don't learn the skills at a class-wide level, we move them into small group training, just like you saw in Kevin's study. If that doesn't work, we move up to the functional assessment and treatment process. What questions do we have on, on the prevention program? Again, I didn't get into the class-wide details. We use behavior skills training. We model it. We talk about it. We practice it time and time again. If they don't get it right, if they do the teaching during the day, this is all day, if they uh, whine instead of asking us for help, what we do is we remind them of the situation specific behavior. Remember, if something's really difficult, just say, help me, please. OK, let's try it. And we give them a practice opportunity. That's how we teach, OK? Instructions, rationale. Modeling, role play, differential reinforcement, feedback with a practice opportunity. It's called behavior skills training. That's what we do on a class-wide basis. Okay, Dennis? Uh, yeah, Greg, uh, what was the duration uh, of that, uh, the group data, that you, the, the group study that you just showed? Great. The approximate duration from the pre-test to the post-test was seven months. So we still didn't perhaps address the developmental psychologist's concern that perhaps this stuff would develop on their own. But these were five-year-old children. So these weren't two. They used to say that when we talked about getting grants to do with this with three-year-olds. They said, well, give them a year. Give them two years. These were five-year-old kids about to enter, enter elementary school uh, with risk. But when we did not challenge them with the evocative situations and assertively teach the social skills, we saw the problem behavior emerge for these kids. Okay. Have you um, sought to replicate this in any public school settings outside of your development center? Yeah, well, the, the, um, the first study was done in our child development center at KU, and no one respects those data because they said, well, that's a weird center run by weird behavior analysts. <laughs> so we do that in the real world, as though my world was fake there, as though those kids weren't real. But uh, nevertheless, we did a Head Start program. So I had no administrative influence. We were guests there. And that was the second study I showed. So we did in Head Start uh, preschools. And these kids were at a little bit greater risk. And then Kevin's studies were done in preschools that we had absolutely no relationship with, other than we were welcome there as guests to help the teachers provide this. So all studies but the first one were done in programs that we had no administrative influence over. Yeah. And implemented by their teachers, not us. Just a quick question. The, the post test for the control group, yes. were the antecedent modifications removed for that? Excellent. This is a beautiful question. Thank you. I'm sorry I ran over that. These are called baseline probes. In the baseline probes, there's no treatment and there's no non contingent reinforcement. In other words, we put the evocative situations in place in the baseline probes. So, yes, the kids in the control group had months of kind of getting things done for them, and now they're in situations where they have to remove glue caps, where they have to use their words to get the teacher's attention and all that stuff. And what they brought with them was not skills because they did not learn them, but what emerges is problem behavior, right? The, the easiest effective response in those situations. Yeah. Very good. I think good. there are a couple online. One of them's a monster. <laughs> I, I don't have anything but the ones from earlier. I'm sorry. Okay. 
Okay, uh, maybe they're up top. Let me check. Is the one about the assessments from earlier? Some assessments. I'll just ask it. Yes, please. What are some of the assessments that you use to identify goals for skill acquisition that you've discussed? Uh, uh oh. Now I'm going to get in trouble with my friends. Uh, I don't do any. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a pretty simple one. Uh, here's what I do. Uh, I, I am not a whole child service provider. Uh, I'm, I work with families that have kids with severe problem behavior. And when they have severe problem behavior, my skills are, I am going to work on before ever meeting the family is communication, toleration, and compliance. Play skills, too, usually thrown in there. When I'm going into classrooms, we're trying to design environments to promote the best behavior. I'm trying to design environments to promote the behaviors of communication, toleration, compliance, play skills, and friendship skills. <coughs> so I'm kind of a, a, a four or five trick pony, if you will. OK, I don't work on developing the whole child. I'm developing uh, these parts. But uh, let me put it a different way, a less self-deprecating way. To me, these are the most important skills. Uh, you don't need the ABLES or the VB map to know that these are the skills you need to work on. And if these skills are not in the child's repertoire, please work on these skills. Uh, you look at, look at the early elementary school readiness literature. 30 years ago, what teachers and parents wanted the kids to know were prepositions, numbers, letters, colors, state capitals. If you look at the school readiness literature now in the last 10 years, what uh, the top five things, I believe, are uses their words, listens, uh, uh, tolerates disappointment, shares and cooperates, and I'm sorry I'm missing the fifth one. I think it's be empathetic. People want the social skills. Teachers want the social skills. Parents want the social skills. We all know if the social skills aren't intact, all the other academic stuff is for naught. Okay? So I'm sorry, I, I readily admit I do not use the ABLES of the VB map just because my job doesn't uh, necessitate it. But on the flip side of that, your job doesn't necessitate either if severe problem behavior is in the mix. I believe you know what the skills are I need to teach without doing the developmental assessment. <laughs> Although I do think the VB map and the ABLES are super. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm serious. I'm not kidding around. There are a lot of developmental batteries out there, but I, VB map and the ABLES are wonderful. And thank goodness they've been developed. And we're at the University of Kansas. We inherited a child development center that was around a long time. We had a teacher manual. I had. 800 skills, we worked on it too. We had an 800 skill curriculum. So I had that to go by, but it was funny how I kept going back. Communication, toleration, compliance, play skills. I mean, those four skills just kept emerging, even out of my 800 skill uh, curriculum. OK. Uh, time for a break? Time for a break. I'm asking. You are correct, my okay. friend. Let's do a break. It's uh, 2.05. How about we say 215 with a gentleman's agreement? We'll probably